Welcome back to our 20s. I am honored today to be joined by my great friend and former rowing captain, Michael Pagliaro, or as I like to call him, Pags. When the world around you doesn't understand your goals or see the same vision you do, do you let their doubts consume you or do you continue to fight for what you believe in? Today, we'll be using our time as collegiate rowers as an analogy for life to display why giving up is never the answer when it comes to your dreams. Without further ado, Michael Pagliaro. This leadership that you have, this passion that you have, and you are so dedicated to your passions. You have such a great strength and you know what you want, you want and you go after it. Where did that come from in, in childhood? Did, was it something that happened in your childhood at any specific event that you, you get so, I, I don't know if obsessed is the right word, but you're so focused and you're so determined to accomplish what you wanted, what you want to do. And you're willing and able to lead people to that same goal. How did, how did that come to be? Yeah. So, you know, Thinking about that, I growing up, I have four siblings. Um, I have two older brothers, an older sister, and a little brother. Um, and with all those people in the house, things tend to get pretty competitive. Um, and I was always super competitive growing up. Um, I was the kid who would argue called strikes in the wiffle ball game, and flag football calls, and I lose my temper all the time. And I never really had like somewhere to channel that competitiveness or anger or angst. Um, I was never good enough at any sport. I mean, growing up, I didn't really fit. I wasn't super athletic. I mean, I was, you know, CYO athletic level, but I wasn't, you know, on the level of AAU and certain high school teams. And when I got to high school, um, I was cut from the basketball team. Um, so, you know, right there even, you know, more angst building up. And then I found rowing, my older sister and older brother, um, they were rowers, my sister was a coxswain. Um, so that that kind of gave me the open door to it. And I picked it up pretty naturally. Um, and, you know, my freshman year, we won a lot. And that sort of gave me that competitive edge to, to channel all that past, you know, angst into. Um, and it just kind of kept going from there all the way through high school and into college. And when I found somewhere to channel all that energy, it came into, you know, into my performance, but also sort of a leadership style for me. Um, rowing is a huge team sport. I mean, every poster you see in an office building in, you know, I was <laughs> yeah. applying for jobs and I saw it across the top. Like we work well as a team. So when the goal is to win and you can't do it alone, it's hard, you know, you don't really have a choice, you know, you don't have a choice not to, to be a leader or be at, at the least, you know, a, a follower of that leader or, you know, somebody on pace with him. Um, you don't really have a choice if you want to be a part of, the, of a fast boat. So that's sort of where it all stems from. I think in life as a whole, there's, this shift I've been seeing where people are scared to admit that they're there to win. Where we talk a lot about, Oh, I want to be there for the, you know, if we're in a corporate setting, I like, I like the people that I'm with. Uh, I like my classmates. I like my friends, but I think competition is very necessary in, in aspects of our life, whether it be sports, whether it be our career, you have to be able to compete with yourself first and foremost. And I've always had the opinion that if you're doing something that you love, and you're not there to win, then why are you doing it in the first place? If you're not giving 100% every single time you go in the boat, every single time you step on the field, every single time you step into your career that you're trying to make into something greater, you should stop doing it because you're just kind of wasting your time. And I think that's where we were with rowing, especially is you were so committed and you were such a leader. And I found myself in a place later on down the line where I was not admitting to myself that I wasn't there to win. I was there for all those reasons I just described. I was there for my teammates. I was there for my friends that I had on the team. I, I was there for all the wrong reasons that you don't want a teammate to be competing. Um, when it comes when it comes to rowing specifically, was that fire your main factor for being as good as you were? I mean, because you were elite. <laughs> and I, I don't use that word lightly. You were the best of the best, especially on our team. You were more determined than everyone else. You were working harder than everyone else. Was it just this fire that you wanted to be the best at what you were doing? Or was it just a genuine love for the sport? Maybe like a little mix between the two. Thank you. Um, 
so, you know, as I mentioned, I, I got cut from the basketball team. I love playing basketball, but I, you know, there's certain features about myself that don't really allow me to compete. You know, I'm mm-hmm. not the tallest guy out there and I can't jump the highest. I can't shoot very well, but, um, so in terms of the sport in and of itself, no, there's nothing specifically about rowing. You know, I love, yeah. you know, steady stating and watching the boat run. Like that's, that's a great feeling to me, but I'd like to win. And that's the sport where I found winning came natu- more naturally to me. I was more apt to win in rowing than I was to win, you know, baseball or basketball. Yeah. So, um, in terms of where that sort of edge came from, it's the winning and, you know, you can't win alone and it forced me to sort of step up in a way. Um, but I come from a competitive high school. Um, St. Joe's prep is a you know, very competitive scholastic team. Um, they've been unstoppable the last few years. And I had the pleasure of being the captain of that team for two years. Um, and that level of competition, that level, I wasn't the fastest kid on my high school team. Um, that level of rowing is just the norm there. Um, and in coming to Fairfield, um, I, I thought I was going to quit. Um, you know, before I moved into Fairfield in the fall of 2018, um, I was sitting with my mom and dad and I was like, I don't want to be known as the rower because, you know, for better or for worse, that was sort of my reputation in high school. Um, and I was like, I want to get to college and I want to, you know, do, you know, I didn't know what college was. I wanted to like, my version of college was Monsters University. I wanted to like experience (laughs) all that college had to offer. I wanted to be an Uzma Kappa. Yeah. Yeah. Play Frisbee on the quad. But then I got there, um, and I, I really, you know, I had, for reasons outside of rowing, I had a tough transition to college, um. And the guys on the team, like your class, um, the class 2020 and 2019 were all, they were above me at the time. They were, you guys are so great to me. Even if you didn't really like me, I couldn't really tell that much. So um, <laughs> coming on to the scene, uh, I felt accepted. I felt like people were, you know, kind to me. And I was like, you know what, I'll stick around because I, I really do love these guys. That That's very touching and don't worry i do very much like you you're here right now thank you <laughs> I, w- I want to take it back even before fear field real quick because I-, I was having a good conversation with my friend last episode that actually is just airing today or the other day and she was also an athlete in college and we were having this discussion about her time as a softball athlete and how it got cut short due to covid and our discussion was going down the line of she was going through this experience. It was really hard on her and people around her couldn't understand why she was taking it so heavily that, you know, she was an athlete her whole life. She'd been pursuing softball this entire time and it was just taken away from her. And some people were even invalidating those feelings saying, well, at least this isn't happening in your life right now. At least this isn't happening. There's so many times in our athletic career in our life as a whole where experiences happen to us and, we see it happen to our teammates and maybe we don't fully understand what's going on. We did, we can't live in their shoes and fully experience those emotions, but we can relate to them in a way. And I think you and I relate in a very similar way when it came to how we ended up at Fairfield as a whole. My, my experience was I wanted to go to the military Academy more than anything in the world. And I pursued that experience. I tried as hard as I could and I was on the doorstep and got taken away at the last minute. And when that happened, it was just shattered. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I'd been a baseball athlete my whole life. I'd been pursuing this for my entire high school career, and now I ended up at Fairfield. You had a very similar experience where we talked about it. You went to an elite program in high school. You were an elite rower, even if you don't want to, want to admit it. It's true. You don't have to be humble about that one. Um, you had everything lined up to go on and make it to a higher program, and then injury kind of took that away from you and you end up at Fairfield similar type of circumstance we end up in a place where we don't expect that we're going to be I've I've had to rationalize that for a while and I think I finally rationalized it in my head but I'm interested to hear how did you go about rationalizing that kind of experience because when I went through something that I viewed as such a, a failure even though it wasn't a failure it was just going down the path that I needed to be on I just didn't know it yet 
But at the time, it was just I thought of it as only failure. So with your similar type of experience, how did how did you go about navigating? Yeah, so my college recruiting process was uh, non-traditional. Rowing recruiting is a lot different than say lacrosse recruiting you'll see freshman or sophomore lacrosse kids recruit uh committing in their in that year but rowing yeah. recruiting doesn't really start until your senior year because not that many kids start rowing until high school um so going into senior year um i my team got a new coach um so completely new territory for everybody completely different background than our previous coach um, and, you know, us seniors were like, okay, you know, this is the time where we had had a great relationship with our past coach in terms of sending us off to certain colleges where we wanted to go. Um, and this coach in particular um, came in and, you know, he made the program his own, whatever way he chose to do that. Um, some people thought it was harsher than others. Um, him and I had our disagreements. Um, but one main thing was when we had, we had this erg workout. And as I mentioned, I wasn't the fastest guy on the team, but there was a day where the Brown coach was in the erg room with us. And, you know, for whatever reason, I had a really good attitude that day. I was getting everybody <clears throat> amped for this interval workout <clears throat> similar to um, that 10 by 300 workout we did with Charles. It was yeah. something that like short nature where you can talk to everybody around you. Um, and after the practice, um, the Brown coach came up to me and he was like, Hey, like, here's my phone number. Like, give me a call. And you know, the recruiting process ensues. Um, and my coach at the time was really pushing me to, to apply to Brown, to, to get my SAT subject test in order. Mind you, I'm not a straight A student. I never was, I never really have been. Um, my SAT is probably 500 points lower than yours. Um, but so, you know, seeing you know where your athletic ability can possibly take you was like oh my god holy shit like that's yeah. that's intense um and in a matter of i think two weeks um i had you know messed up my back completely as pretty much every rower does and i also got mono um which is a very fun um disease um, wouldn't really call it disease condition maybe <laughs> um so I wasn't really able to progress senior year as much as I could have. Um, additionally, um, I sort of took a look in the mirror and I was like, I admire what the Jesuits do. I love Jesuit education. I love the Kairos retreat. I love everything that comes with it. Um, and is that something I'm really willing to give up to, you know, maybe applied to Brown and get cut or not even get in or so I, you know, reached out to Fairfield and before I knew it, I was in my car on the phone with Charles. Um, and it was a done deal by, you know, the end of the end of the winter, I was, I was committed. Um, so yeah. It's a very adult decision to make at such a young age to know that you're committed to something that a lot of people, I didn't know about the Jesuit education before I got to Fairfield. I didn't know it existed, honestly. And that that's amazing that you were so in tune with what's important to you at that time, that you're able to make that kind of decision. When we make tough decisions like that, it, there's always a case that people don't understand what we're doing. Th they can't because they're not on our own head. Was that the situation when you made that decision to go to Fairfield? Did you get any blowback from any of your friends from your teammates maybe any, any, anyone closer to you saying why would you make that kind of decision or was it pretty supportive um my friends were really supportive of me like my my high school rowing friends are some of the best friends that you know i'll have for the rest of my life um yeah. the main blowback was um from my my head coach the new coach that i mentioned um i don't know if the word's disappointment or if the word is shock or surprise but um Needless to say, the deadline for Brown, I believe, is New Year's Day, and we practiced January 2nd, um, and he pulled me aside. I was like, oh, yeah, you got all your stuff in? And I was like, no. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that was a tough conversation because 
he wanted to come in his first year and send his captain to an Ivy League school and make a splash. And I understand that. However, he doesn't have to go there. He doesn't have to even apply there. He doesn't have to maybe even get cut if he's not improving, if he's injured. Um, so it was, it was definitely a tough blowback for him, but my friends and family, the best, you know, I got all the support from them. That's all that matters at the end of the day, the, our loved ones. Yep. Uh, if you have a supportive base around you, you can do anything. And we, we talked about this before we even started the show. You can do anything. You, you can't do everything. But when, right. when you have that kind of support, you can do anything. Yep. And when you have someone in a, in a position of power like that, trying to, you know, like you said, he wants to make a splash because he wants some recognition for, you know, growing you into that level of athlete. At the, you got to do what you got to do. You got to do what's best for you. And, you know, I didn't I didn't know that part of the story where I, I mean, I, it's just a testament to your character and, and your strength to know what you got. You got to do what's best for you. And you did it. That is something that happens a lot. I've noticed as we've transitioned into our 20s out of school where there's a lot of voices coming at you from a lot of different angles telling you to go down this path, go down this career, move to this city, take uh, take this person out on a date. You know, I think they'd be great for you and stuff like that. Yeah. So many voices. And the difficult part is some of them are opinions that you value and some of them are just opinions that are <laughs> just being opinions. And you got to differentiate between the two. And it's not easy. It's it's not easy <laughs> at all. It, it, it's something that leads to a lot of struggle and a lot of anxiety for a lot of us. Uh, and it sounds like at a young age, you were able to do it pretty well, <laughs> which, which is quite the accomplishment on its own when when it comes to listening to people around you how do you how do you go about accepting people's advice and knowing where you got to draw the line you just got to say you know this is this is what i need to do this is this is the path that i need to go down it's definitely something i've struggled with feedback and um you know listening to other people because when you're deemed as the leader you think you know i'm the i'm the head honcho i can tell you whatever the hell i want um, yeah. but you know, in my experience, you know, leading, especially Fairfield's team, um, they're not just, you know, the rowers on Fairfield's team aren't just going to do something because you tell them to, um, if coach says, come in, do a 12 K and write your score on the board, that's not going to get everybody in there to do it. Yeah. Um, and my main thing coming in and then leaving my favorite thing that changed was the participation in the second workouts um, mm -hmm. and the second sessions, because when I got there, you know, the completion rate was in the 20%, 25%. And when I left, most days it was 100%. Um, you know, class conflicts, sickness. Um, but, you know, I, and it took me a while. I mean, you can attest to how much of a dick I could be when it came to that kind of stuff. Um, and, but by the time I was a senior and I know you can't, you know, speak to it cause you graduated. Um, but my approach was much different. It, it went from, you know, do this or I hate you to like, let's all get in here together because there's no chance that we compete with X, Y, Z school at dad Vale's IRAs. If at 3 PM on a Wednesday when nobody has class, we're sitting, you know, in our rooms, eating or going to the toilet like why don't we all just get in here and do it together and make it fun i've reflected upon this a lot because this, this is the theme that i wanted to have for this conversation where the overarching theme that i see with your your time at fairfield was you were determined to win at all costs and you're willing to do whatever it took and the people around you weren't and it's a theme that carries over into life and we're going to use rowing as the analogy for today, but it's when the world doesn't understand what you're trying to do. It doesn't understand what motivates you. How do you keep going when everyone around you is trying to, you know, bring you down, bring you back down to their level say, Oh no, why would you, why would you work that hard? You just come be with us, come party, just come do all the fun stuff. It, you know, the water's fine here. It's, it's rough over there. And I think that in my mind perfectly encapsulates your, your experience with the team because you show up on campus your first day and you know the room 
changed the second you walked in. You're the, you're the biggest guy there now in terms of sheer size. Uh, you're the fastest guy there now, and everybody respected that right away. And you know, from day one, people were ready to make you the leader, and you were the leader. You led by example, and you led vocally. And I think, you know, you, you alluded to it as well, where I think your leadership style evolved a lot over the time that I was with you, where it goes from very fiery, like always very, very demanding of everyone around you, but for a good reason, just a reason people didn't want to accept. And you, yeah. you transition more towards the end of, okay, I'm still going to be fiery, but we're going to shift the messaging around a little bit. Like I need to be fiery because I need to fire you up if we're going to compete at the highest level. Mm -hmm. um, so let's, let's focus in on your leadership before we even get into just performance. For sure. It's difficult to be a leader at that young of an age. You're leading people who are older than you, who have more experience than you, they'll, they'll claim at least, um, at, at the college level. And you're kind of thrust into that role immediately. Was it difficult at first? Or was it something that you thought that you were prepared for? Because I think anytime I've found myself in a leadership role, I kind of uh, cower a little bit. And then it takes it takes some time to grow into it. I definitely understand that. And there have been positions in my life, in my job that, you know, maybe you're thrown into an uncomfortable position and I definitely can, you know, you know, hide. Um, yeah. But with rowing, you know, I feel like if you're thrown into a leader, leadership position and you have like a lot of experience, you feel like you could do it. And, you know, I came from, you know, pretty competitive background and um, I thought that this was something that I can do. And from freshman year to senior year, I think that more growth occurred for me than if I went to a IRA, a final school. I think that, you know, at a school like that, you know, you can meet a lot of people, you can go really fast, you can row for the national team, but you're at the end of the day, you row for them and, you know, sometimes you could feel like a cog in a machine, you know, the machine that is Yale or Harvard and nothing against those guys, all power to them. They're mm -hmm. impressive. Um, but, you know, I, I think that I grew a lot, but um, in terms of being thrust into a leadership position, I don't think that I was ever nervous. Um, as I mentioned before, the transition to college for me wasn't, the easiest, you know, for a few other reasons that, you know, ha don't have to do with rowing. And, you know, I sort of dialed in to rowing doubly. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, you know, so I could distract myself from, you know, whatever else was going on, um, which I think, you know, sort of contributed to that super fiery attitude and that super like, do your second workouts or screw you type of type of attitude. Um, and I also took a couple, you know, um, pages from my high school coach you know me and him didn't always get along but you know there's a lot of things that he did right that i tried to learn from and you know i think that coming in hot isn't always the best strategy but sometimes it's the only strategy you feel like you have i only asked that question because you never looked nervous <laughs> and i was interested to say if you would say that you were because you certainly uh on the outer shell never showed it and there was never a time where i doubted that you were nervous to do what you were doing and I'd i say it's a test that, sorry, sorry. what you sorry say? i'd say that you know pure rowing wise pure sport wise um there wasn't a lot of nerves mm -hmm. but in terms of like gelling socially with the team and you know seeing where i fit in and any sort of dynamic um, definitely a lot of nerves there. Um, you know, when you walk in, you know, yeah. there's different groups that form on the team. Not to say that the men's team is at all clicky because I don't think it is, at least when I was there. Um, but there are, you know, certain guys who talk more than others and I just didn't know where I would fit in. Um, oh yeah, I, I completely a lot of nerves right. there. Yeah. And you know, you, you alluded to that there's some other things going on when you come into school and you use rowing as an outlet. It was the same thing for me. I came into school and I'd been an athlete my whole life and I was like, all right, I'm not going to be an athlete anymore. I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. I didn't have no friends. My friends were from baseball. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the general <laughs> blast email goes out to every single student who showed up on day one saying, you want to come row? And I was like, I guess so. I and mean, it sounds athletic enough. And like you said, you know, you 
there are clicks like you form clicks with all the guys in your grade you form clicks yeah. with guys who are from your uh, hometown area it, it's just the natural bonds that bond you together mm-hmm. but it it's difficult when you walk in and you're a freshman and you're now uh, the star of the show you're the leader of the team and like you said now you're trying to navigate all these different clicks you're trying to figure out what the dynamic of these guys who have known each other for three years is you're trying to find out the dynamic of these two guys uh who are from the same hometown and knew each other before they even got to school that like there's so many crazy things going on and when you're trying to lead a team i think this is true in any environment it, it's important to know the people that you're working with because you got to understand what what the dynamic is here and you got to understand how you can communicate with everyone and it's still something that i i try to work on is just getting that groundwork set up where you have those initial conversations. We, we would have like our initial, like a team gatherings, just like team barbecues and everything, just setting that tone, getting to know everybody. And I thought that was so important towards building a good solid team culture. And I think where we went wrong in the beginning of your tenure, especially was we had such a solid team culture in terms of being friends, but we yeah. didn't have such a solid team culture in terms of being teammates. And what I mean by that is, in terms of being actual athletes, that wasn't our goal. Our goal was to have a solid group of friends. And I think we really succeeded at that. But <laughs> when you tried to take it that next step, especially in the beginning, you had a handful of guys, and I think we all know who they are, <laughs> that were really serious about being athletes. And then you had another whole subsection of guys where I would fit into it where it was, uh, yeah, some days I feel like being an athlete, but some days I just kind of feel like being a, being a bro was like – how i viewed it in my head yeah. when you're when you're trying to lead a team like that I, it's the same kind of question i asked seamus when we discussed when, when you're trying to lead a team like that where you have two completely separate cohorts what's going through your mind is it how am i going to get this message across to people or is it you know they're gonna be doing their own thing i just got to worry about me and my own because rowing's a kind of a siloed off sport you, where you can worry about who's in your four who's in your eight you know, everyone else can be doing the same thing. Did that thought ever cross your mind? And I'm not going to be offended if you said it, it did, but did it ever cross your mind where you're like, okay, these people here, they don't want to compete. I need to focus on me and everyone else around me who wants to be at my level. Right. Um, what you mentioned earlier about like, you guys did a really good job of being like friends, but not so much as being, you know, rowers and competitors. Um, yeah. I think that that like, almost being best friends with everybody before you can compete is kind of tough. I have found a lot of my friends, you know, you included while I'm competing, whether it's in the room or in the weight room. And, you know, I stay friends with those people because I see the way that they work. Mm -hmm. Um, It's hard for me, you know, outside of a handful of great guys, you know, that I am friends with, it's hard for me to, to, to make friends outside of like a, you know, either a competitive sphere or a job sphere where I see like, okay, this is the way that this person works. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of answering your question about, um, you know, did that thought ever cross my mind? Of course it did. Um, and not just freshman year. Um, I tried every way I knew how, you know, growing up from being 18 to, being 22 or 21 to get the message across that, you know, this is a team first and this is a social grounds afterwards. And like, you can't just show up when you want to. Um, And it was so, um, it got so bad that, you know, you know, the story to the winter break of your senior year, when there were only a few seniors left on the team where I met with the coaches, I was like, we need to make a change because I've been on the team for two and a half years and you know, for lack of a better term, you know, no pun intended. We had some dead weight on the team. Yeah. And that's when we, that's, you know, in my Fairfield rowing history, that was the first time I ever seen cuts be made. And, you know, I, it was a tough decision and I definitely made myself some enemies, but um, I think the team's better for it. I think, you know, line in the sand after however many years of opportunities to prove oneself, we didn't have a high bar to pass the fitness test mm-hmm. or the air test. Um, and certain guys just didn't make the cut. It's, it's a tough conversation to have, but I think it's the same in the business world too, where there's a line between being friends and there's a line between doing your business. Yeah. And you know, maybe somebody listens to this part of the conversation. They're thinking, 
oh, how could how could you do that? Why wouldn't why wouldn't you just want to you know try to include everybody and have everybody included? Y- you got to draw the line when you're trying to win, like we're talking about. And I, I think it transitions beyond sports. Again, this is just an analogy using sports for life. You have to be surrounded by the people who are going to promote you to be the best version of yourself. Yep. If you have this dead weight attached to you, you're only hindering yourself. And you have to make a tough call sometimes where you have to say, you know, something's got to change if I want to get to this next level. And it sounds tough to understand from an outsider if they're listening, where they, they can't really understand the dynamic of our own team if you weren't there. But the, the dead weight is the best use. And I was part of the dead weight. <laughs> I'm not afraid to admit it. Where a, a change needed to happen, where you need to cut off the part that's not willing to contribute to the whole. The part that's just there for an aspect that is not contributing to the team winning. And I think as soon as you made that decision, I, I it's evident <laughs> based off of the results of the team now, especially in the past year, especially in your senior year, that something started to shift where it started to graduate from a group of friends to an actual team. And yeah, that's going to piss some people off, if, especially if you were there like I was because you were there because you wanted to have a group of friends. But it's a business, just like anything else. You're on a team and you're doing business. A lot of college athletes, if you talk to them, they'll say, yeah, you know, college sports isn't as fun as it was in high school because this is more of a business now. This is my job. That's, exactly. That's that's how it is. And I, I, again, I think it's a testament to your character that you stuck through it and you were able to figure out a way to get to this place now where the program is thriving more than it's ever been and they're on an upward trajectory. It's because of guys like you. And uh, it's more of an apology for me where at the time I was contributing to the idea of oh, God, why is a team culture have to shift? Why can't it just stay fun? Why, why can't, why does it have to be this way? And sometimes you got to make that tough call. If you want things to change, you're the only person in your own life who is going to make that initiative. No one else is going to do it for you. You have to yeah. stand up for yourself and you have to make that change. And you did it and you did it quite well. <laughs> I have to say yeah. when, when you, when you reflect upon how far the program has come. Do you recognize the impact that you had or does it kind of just go by? I mean, is it something that it, you think about? Because it's true. It, it's because of you. It's because of guys who they know that they are, that the program is where it is now. I mean, we talked about, you could go to a big program and you could be a cognitive machine or you can make an impact and right. you made the impact. Uh, has it kind of hit you yet that you actually left your mark? Um, I definitely don't look in the mirror and I'm like, I'm the reason that, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Like the selfish, the, not the, so <laughs> like the, I, yeah. the way I look at it is, is I was surrounded by great people. Um, you know, freshman yeah. year was tough for me. Um, and each year, you know, it got, it got easier because with the new classes that came on, the, you know, the attitude would slowly change. It would slowly change. It would slowly change. And each year, you know, we had to feed her some kids through it. But, you know, they bought in faster than the year before. And it, it got easier because of them. You know, guys in the grade below me, especially Mike Green and Brady. Um, if you ask them how many texts that they got for me every day, like inspiring words and, you know, quotes and all this shit, all these you know, the I messages that you have to tap to expand that I would send unbelievable worse than the group me, if you can imagine. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I recognize it as a team effort because, you know, I, there can't be a one man rowing team because I don't know how to scroll. Um, but I recognize it as a team effort because if, if nobody else bought in that I would just be this broken record that was just screaming his head off. And I probably would have, either been forced to quit or I would have just been miserable the whole time. And, you know, there were times when, yeah, maybe I feel like I'm alone in this endeavor early on, but I knew that, you know, the team had a lot of capacity for change. It still does it's still growing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's nowhere near perfect. Um, and, you know, I'm just excited to see where it goes. Yeah. Everything's always a work in progress. There's always more to be done. As soon as you start, settling as soon as you start feeling comfortable that's when you have to get up and you have to look around at yourself and you have to say okay something's got to change um, so i think that's that's very wise <laughs> i did want to focus in on the group me a little bit because it was something i was oh. thinking about. and it, it's more to apologize more than anything because oh. i i was more in the camp where I, i'll i'll elaborate for anybody who doesn't understand you would send messages in our team group me you would send 
text messages uh, on a fairly regular basis too. Uh, oh, it wasn't it was a rarity. Uh, yeah, <laughs> wasn't really. Wow, that's dedication. <laughs> it, it was. It was definitely at least once a week. I remember, and they they were heartfelt messages, just laying out. You know, this is what we got to do. This is what I envisioned that we could be. And I, I remember there would be times where I, I would look at the message and I'd be like, oh, my God, again. Like, <laughs> and I, I know for a fact other people would have done the same thing. They probably Oh, did the if they even read it. If they Again, even, even if they read it. And I, I was reflecting upon all this. And you know what really clicked for me was this past Christmas, I did this thing where I did like a 25 days of Christmas challenge to try to raise money. 25 days of joy. And, yeah. Um, and part of it was I wrote all these letters for like family and like really close friends. Mm -hmm. And I wrote all these letters and they're, they were very similar in nature to like what you would write for a team where it was long, like they were like a page each full of just, you know, like <laughs> some inspiration about like how I, I wish the person would like do this. And I like, I see this in them. Like I, how much I love the person. I would just give them the letter. And when I was reflecting upon your group meeting, I related it a lot to those letters that I wrote. And I thought to myself, you know, if I gave that letter to somebody and they read like five words of it and they threw it in the trash, I would actually be distraught. <laughs> like yeah. I would, I would, I would, I would maybe cry. I would be like, I just took all that time to, you know, tell somebody how much I love them, how much I care for them. And they didn't even give it the time of day. Yeah. Um, and it just really made me think of, you know, the letters that you would write for us. Uh, I know they're not necessarily letters, but long text messages. And I have to say, I'm sorry, I'm like, because there were so many days where I would just ignore them. I wouldn't read them. And it was out of, you know, selfishness where I, I was not on the same wavelength that you were. I didn't have the same passion for the project that we were working on to build this team. And I just completely rejected all the love and passion that you're trying to give to us to just try to inspire us to be better. You weren't doing it out of a place of like, Oh my gosh, you guys are the worst. Like you have to read this. You have to do everything that I'm saying right now. No, it was just you trying as <laughs> in a different way than you had tried before, just to try to get us to focus and try to listen. And I, I'm sorry. And, um, you know, looking at it upon it now, I, I applaud you for keeping on do the same path even though um, there were people like me who weren't willing to listen. And it's the overall overall theme again for today of there are going to be so many people in your life, especially as we go through our 20s now, that aren't going to understand you. They're not going to listen to you. Um, and they don't see the vision the way that you do. Yeah. But as long as you do, and as long as you're not harming anybody, never give up. Right. Never, ever give up. Because at it doesn't matter what other people think. It, all you have to do is be content with yourself at the end of the day. And you have to know in your heart of hearts that you're doing what's right for you. And you you continue to inspire me so much because you always stuck to your guns. And you always were that guy. You were never the guy who talked to talk. You always walked the walk. And yeah. <laughs> That's Thank you. Yeah. I, so, um, uh, going off to people not reading it and you know what that means is it was it was tough um not my freshman year because i when i was sending those messages as a freshman i was like i have this grand vision for what this team can be because i've seen you know in high school i got exposed to a lot i rode at a lot of different events in 2017 i got a chance to go to the world championship and i've seen um you know guys with you know less physical gifts or less physical talent than what we had doing amazing things. And, you know, Fairfield at the time did not have a great way to expose their rowers to this level of talent. We didn't travel very often. We didn't race any incredibly fast teams where you can see, okay, there's another level to this. It was a lot of, you know, local races against local teams, which, you know, with the resources that Fairfield has, they did what they could. And you know what? I respect that. I had a great career. But where I, you know, came from, I saw a lot of, you know, as I mentioned, people with less do more. And yeah, I walk in and I see guys that are, you know, well over six feet. I'm like, 
we can be better. And they're, you know, really strong guys. We can be better. And, you know, I just got frustrated when people weren't taking it seriously. And it hurt even more when people would mock my group mates or the sports you, um, which is just, you know, uh, Instagram for sports teams. Um, when the, the younger guys would mock me, like junior and senior year. That was definitely tough because it was, it sort of felt like a, a rewind, like we were going back in time um, and I was losing, you know, the respect I thought that some guys have for me. But at the end of the day, um, by the time I graduated, I knew that I'd considered doing a fifth year, but I was like, you know what, there's really no point in me staying. I feel like I've exhausted, you know, outstayed my welcome. And I think I've done everything that I wanted to do. Um, and I think the team's better for it. It's it's funny that you say it feels like at the end, history was repeating itself. And sometimes it, it does just feel like that, where you feel like you're finally progressing, you're starting to see a change, and then it just comes right back down to where it was before. Yeah. And it it's that roller coaster effect of, you know, I wish it could just be up here all the time, but sometimes it's way down here. I was watching a TikTok the other day and the guy was like, I was talking to my therapist and I was like, why can't I just be up here all the time? I like, why do I find myself down here? I wish I could just find myself, you know, nice at this one level. And the therapist responds back to him and he says, you know, if, if we're looking at a heart rate monitor, it goes up and down, it goes up and down. Yeah. If you're like this, that means you're dead. <laughs> if you're just yeah. on a flat line, that means, that means something went wrong and you're not here anymore. So if you were experienced in life all the way like this, then what's the point? You got to be, down here if you want to know what it feels like to truly be up here yeah to enjoy and it. exactly so i i think even even though you had to go through that where there was a bit of a cycle where you finally felt like maybe you're making your progress up here and then it kind of goes back down here it's, it's just a testament to you working hard to you being able to say okay i feel like i'm down here right now what do i got to do to get back up here um it's it was a wild ride to say the least um sure. our, our time as rovers I want to focus on, uh, you mentioned at the beginning, the, the Jesuit education aspect of it all, totally. because, you know, sports are nice, but I don't think we should always tie ourselves to sports as our identity. I did that for a while, um, yeah, especially sure. in high school, but there, there's so many other aspects to life that, that translate into sports, that translate into life as a whole. And Jesuit education, just religion as a whole, was something that I never expected to be at the forefront of my life like it was. But we, we went through experiences like you talked about um, with the education itself. What, what does it mean to you to be able to tie some aspect of your, of your personality, of your, of your spirituality um, to something greater than you like that? It's, it's similar with the sports team. You're able to tie yourself to being in a team, something greater than you. But when you're tying yourself um, spiritually, religiously to something higher than you how does it how does it flow into you how does it how does it work with you in terms of your personality how does it flow into you when you're trying to be a leader for other people um, just in just in aspects of your life like that yeah so in terms of leadership i think that judgment education is really important um you know there's the term be a man for others there's so many terms that are great um but that's the one that stuck out for me um, and when it comes to leadership or even in my day-to-day -day life, um, I think being a man for others, a lot of the times includes, especially in leadership, doing the things that you expect of others to do. Like, I can't ask you guys to go and do your second workouts if I'm not in there mm -hmm. twice as much as I should be. Um, and, you know, as I got older, I was able to develop deeper relationships with the younger guys and sort of be a mentor that I wasn't able to do with the older guys um, and sort of take a step into their life um, and, you know, be that big brother, be that man for others. Um, and, you know, I've struggled as well with tying my life to being an athlete. I rode for eight years um, and I just graduated last May and it's definitely tough being on the other side of it now, but something I can always tie myself to whether or not I can row anymore, which I don't plan to do ever again. Um, I can tie myself to everything I learned, um, you know, in Jesuit education. Um, I think that I'm better for it. Um, and I think that 
you know, at Fairfield, it was more of a a la carte Jesuit education. You sort of had to seek it out. It wasn't going to seek you out, which Mm -hmm. initially disappointed me. Um, But, you know, we found our Jesuit education. Um, We did have religion together. We had Kairos. We had um, those experiences together. Um, And I actually had the chance to go um, last spring um, and lead the retreat. And, um, you know, that's my favorite part. I mean, obviously, it's the big retreat. Everybody loves it. I think it's absolutely magical event. Um, Can't get too much into it on the public but um i think that carrying like that you know you're part of something bigger than you carrying that in your life can automatically make bad things that happen to you seem kind of small i i agree with you on the aspect that you just said of our education where you had to go seek it out but i'm kind of glad that we did it meant more to me in the end that i had to go seek it out Uh, it's kind of like my experience when i got confirmed at school yeah. I, I grew up semi-religious. It, it had always been a part of me, but it wasn't at the forefront of who I was. And it, it started to transition when we went to school and I became surrounded by people who would constantly promote it. Uh, I would see the benefits that it brought people just in terms of having community and in terms of having something to believe in but beyond yourself. And when I went to go get confirmed, it felt different. And I knew that it felt different compared to if I would have just gone through like uh, your normal CCD program. And like, I think the ninth grade, they're just like, yeah, now you're confirmed. Like, congratulations. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Seeking it, seeking it out like that. It just meant more. And I think it's very true in a lot of aspects of our life where it's not going to come to you. You have to go out there yourself and you have to make it happen on your own. And whether it's you on the rowing team, making it happen and you leading the way, whether it's you, uh, in religion and you leading the way for people to experience something as amazing as Kairos. I, again, we can't spoil it because that's ruining half, half the fun right there. Well, but it's not, it's not something that the average person does in their, in their lifetime, but you went and you sought it out and you made it a part of, of who you were. If someone's listening to this right now and they're going through a similar type of experience where they they know they're doing something, uh, maybe they don't see the results, maybe the world's against them. What's your advice to them on how to just keep on going and keep on fighting for what they know is right? That's a great question. Um, so I, I would say, you know, for me in college, um, setting goals for myself and seeing the big picture was always, you know, but sometimes it's too far fetched. It was always for me, like that was a lot of the times enough saying like, and I leave, and I come back in 10 years, I can see that, you know, there's 10 new names on the ERG record board. Mine's not even close to being on there. It's IRA trophies everywhere. That's what I saw every single day when I walked into the ERG room. And my advice to keep up with the day-to-day is that if you don't do it, nobody's coming to save you. Nobody's going to do it for you. And it's a little bit of tough love, but, you know, I know you read a couple of my group me messages. There's a lot of tough love in there that nobody is going to do it for you. Nobody's going to, nobody cares enough about you, not your parents, not your siblings, not your best friend to live the life you want to live for you. And I recently, you know, heard that quote and I was like, you know, that's interesting. I've always, you know, had this idea of like absolute unconditional love from everybody that I know. And I have this vision of how I want to live my life. And I think it's kind of liberating to realize that no one's going to come do that for me. And, you know, sometimes you got to embrace the suck. You got to do things that you don't want to do. But if this is what you really want, you need to do it for yourself. And that's, that's my tough love. I don't have too much of a sentimental, um, lovely Jesuit educated phrase there, but that's all I got. I think you worded it perfectly. (laughs) Once again, a major thank you to Pags for joining me for today. I can only hope that somebody who is listening today and is ready to get back off of the campus and continue to persevere for what they believe in. If you like what you hear and you want to hear more, definitely follow along on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you may be hearing this show. If you're watching on YouTube, definitely subscribe, notification bell, all the cool YouTuber stuff. Thank you so much for taking your time out of your day to come in and hang out. It is such a privilege to be able to produce this for all of you, and I can't thank you enough. Until next time. 
See ya.